I'm George Elgard. I'm the program director here at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital Dermatology Program, and I'm welcome, welcoming you all here to this virtual open house. My colleague and chairman, Dr. Kersner, will give you some information about the history of our program, and then the rest of our group, including our excellent residents, will give you a sense of what it's like to be here and uh, visit with us. We wish we could do this live, but uh, hope you, you enjoy this virtual open house. Welcome. I'm Robert Kersner, Chairman and Harvey Blank Professor for the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I wish that we could meet under different circumstances and that some of you would be able to rotate at the University of Miami this year. I'd also wish that those that uh, we select to interview that we could interview in person. But this open house provides an opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit as we look to find a right match for our residency training program. Our name, Dr. Philip Frost, Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery is relatively new. About a year ago, Dr. Philip Frost, who is a dermatologist, was on faculty at the University of Miami and went on to great success in the business world, in the pharmaceutical industry, endowed the department and will help us reach our goals with a continuous surplus of interest over the coming years. This is the center of the Mid uh, University of Miami Jackson Memorial Medical Center complex. In the background is the large county hospital for Miami-Dade County, Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is one of the teaching hospitals affiliated with our institution. In the foreground is a museum called the Alamo, which served as a residency hall and a hospital in prior years. But we have a very large medical center and considered the largest medical center in the United States, one of the largest. That arrow shows that picture I just showed previously. And the big circle shows the large medical center that is University of Miami uh, Jackson Memorial uh, Medical Center. Uh, if you look at the very top of the screen, you'll see downtown Miami. And then beyond that, Biscayne Bay. Beyond that, at the really top of the screen, Miami Beach and then the Atlantic Ocean. So you see that we're positioned between two major highways uh, that run both north, south, and east, west. Now why, what is the take home message that we're gonna to try to in, uh, tell you about over this next uh, two to three hours of this open house? Well, I wanna start with one of the important take home messages is that we're blessed by geography and with some luck and also th things that we built to have the great and best patient pathology in the country. We have a great faculty and we strive ourselves in creating great mentorship for every trainee. As part of our program, and you'll hear, you have the opportunity to contribute to the body of knowledge known as dermatology through various scholarship efforts. Our department has a great tradition and our alumni, who you, some of whom you'll meet today, create a great network. And this is one of the important points of our program. And Miami is a great city, multicultural, vibrant. And these things all combine to give University of Miami, the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery, that we believe is the best training in the US. Now, I talked a little bit about our tradition, and I want to uh, talk a little bit more about that. Founded over 60 years ago, our department has had over 20 department chairs who have been either residents or, uh, or faculty that have gone on to, to be department chairs at other departments of dermatology. Seven departments of dermatology throughout the country were founded by University of Miami people. People have gone on to become medical school deans. Uh, AAD presidents and other dermatology society presidents. Uh, the journal club, uh, journal editors uh, have been from the Department of uh, Dermatology and NIH leaders. The other part of the legacy that's very important 
is innovation discovery. And I'll tell you briefly about the many disease descriptions and the disease pathogenesis we've described here, novel diagnostics, new therapeutics, and we pride ourselves on many firsts that our department has created. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see the three prior chairs of the Department of Dermatology, who I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, Dr. Harvey Blank, Dr. William Eaglestein, and Dr. Lauren Shackman. The last two you'll get to meet during this open house. So as I was highlighting, the former head of the National Institutes of Arthritis, Musculoskeletal, and Skin, Dr. Steve Katz, was a resident here and became arguably among the most famous dermatologists in the world. Two former chiefs at the dermatology branch at the National Institutes of Health are Miami people. As I mentioned, over 20 department chairs. The Blue Journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, which has the highest clinical, uh, highest impact factor of any dermatology journal, was founded by the first resident ever at the University of Miami, J. Graham Smith. Peer Review at, uh, which is now called JAMA Derm, at that time was called Archives of Dermatology, was started by uh, Dr. Harvey Blanc. Editors of all major journals uh, have been from the University of Miami, leaders of all major dermatology organizations, and clinical leaders in all major areas from uh, science of dermatology, psoriasis, wound healing, aesthetics, itch, hair and nails, all come from the University of Miami. And as I talked to you about the recent endowment, even some billionaires, uh, former uh, University of Miami people. Our department has an excellent reputation. As you know, or as you may know, uh, US News and World Report does not rank dermatology departments, uh, but our reputation is excellent. We have a world-class, friendly, and highly productive faculty. And a few years ago, they looked at the uh, publications of uh, dermatology departments across the United States, and we were in the top five uh, here at, uh, in, in that publication. As I briefly mentioned, our department's a little over 60 years old. Uh, we had a celebration of, uh, of both our 50th and 60th anniversaries uh, uh, when they occurred. Um, and the first chair was Dr. Harvey Blanc. And um, uh, as soon as he got to University of Miami, he made a great impact because he helped develop the first oral antifungal agent ever available, Grisia Fulvin. Many other accompli accomplishments occurred during his time as chair. I can't go through all of them. They're listed here. But I didn't mention the many firsts that have occurred at the University of Miami. So we, we were the department that had the first dermatopathologist that was uh, housed in the dermatology department. We had the first Mohs unit in a, uh, housed at a medical school. And we were the first department to, to recognize the importance of surgery as part of dermatologic care. And we changed, we were the first department to change the name from dermatology to what we call now dermatology and cutaneous surgery. Bill Eaglestein, who trained under Harvey Blanc, took over uh, the chair in uh, approximately 1986. Harvey was chair for uh, 30 years. Uh, and uh, you'll meet uh, Dr. Eaglestein a little bit later. And many other uh, accompli accomplishments uh, occurred during uh, Bill's era. Uh, he was probably the, the godfather, a grandfather of, uh, of wound healing. Um, and, he, and he developed uh, the first uh, pig model of wound healing where he was able to study things like vehicles and occlusive dressings um, uh, and their effect on wound healing. Other uh, things were developed, such as the causative agent of sea bather's itch. And going in uh, line with the many firsts, uh, during Bill's era, we, we became the first department to have a full-time cosmetic dermatology and cosmetic dermatology clinic uh, during his time. Larry Shackner was the third chair of our department and still is on, still is on faculty now. He was on faculty under Harvey and Bill and then rose to become chair. He's a world famous pediatric dermatologist. And again, many firsts occurred uh, under Larry as well. Highlighting here uh, was some work that, uh, 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 that the treatment of psoriasis improves the vascular comorbidities and um, also the first US biologic psoriasis clinic was developed for underprivileged patients at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And it still goes on today under the direction of Dr. Paolo Romanelli. 
Now, I took over as chair in 2016, and we were, had a great reputation and very accomplished then, but we've had significant growth over the last uh, uh, four or five years. As you can see from this chart, we doubled our full total faculty from 18 to 36, and we've grown in both clinical and research faculty members. Our faculty is quite diverse, and over 60% of our faculty are internationally born. Um, if you break down a faculty, those 36 full-time faculty members, 13 do bench research, excuse me, uh, 16 do bench research, 13 are full-time researchers, and three are clinician scientists. We also have 36 clinicians. Those 36 clinicians include 23 full-time faculty members, seven part-time or full-time what we call staff physicians who do all, mostly clinical work, and then we have three part-time, additionally, we have three part-time research faculty. And hopefully by the time you start here, we'll have instituted a testing lab to test topical treatments that will go on to be uh, approved by the US Food and Drug Administration. We have a quite vibrant program. So a large residency training program with over 24 residents. We have two research tracks, which we'll hear a little bit more. Another one of the first in the last uh, three years we developed the first in US master's program in skin biology and dermatologic science, which is a program that is a combination of some in-person work and, and some online work. So the vibrancy of uh, those group of students adds to our department. And we have a very large uh, voluntary faculty who teach in a variety of ways at the county hospital, at the VA hospital, um, and also contribute to the vibrancy of the I mentioned the idea of mentorship and, and our, uh, our and faculty participating. We codified this mentorship program uh, last year into uh, uh, what we call the UM Frost Excellence in Mentorship Program, where uh, details are online uh, on our website, and I encourage you to visit our website, but really each person from a resident to our faculty creates a small team to help mentor them and to nurture their career goals as they move through the process of training and in the case of our faculty as they go on to their careers. But we have other programs to help mentor uh, residents. Um, part of it, is, one of them is called the Dermatology Academic Training Program, the DATP, uh, which is a program run by one of our professors, Dr. Ralph Paus, a world expert uh, in hair science. And this program is aimed to stimulate residents to think in a way that to advance knowledge and interact with our um, research faculty members and really broaden the way dermatologists think. We also think that we provide what we call personalized training. The training at Miami, as I mentioned, was we believe the best in the US. And 90% of that training is uh, similar for every one of our residents. But the other 10%, we try to personalize to your interests as a resident as you grow in the program. So if you start developing an interest in pediatric dermatology, then we ensure that you get more training and more mentorship in pediatric dermatology, dermatologic surgery, medical dermatology. Whatever your interests are, we try to personalize the training so that you become uh, poised to succeed in that area after you finish your training. Now, I mentioned our great patients, and it starts with our large catchment area. We're the only major uh, dermatology training uh, program, uh, certainly in the southeast Florida, so uh, uh, for uh, the closest uh, major academic training programs are at University of South Florida and University of Florida, both very, very nice programs, but they're not uh, as robust as we. So we often say that our catchment area includes everything in Central and South America, the Caribbean, and we are, we're the major dermatology program between Caracas and Atlanta. So we have great patients. And what that means is that not only do we get referred a lot of uh, challenging patients from those catchment areas, we see things like tropical diseases. Because we're in South Florida, we get a lot of sun, and that means that there's skin cancer, lots of surgery, photodermatoses, 
And, and often people uh, in some parts of Florida come down to retire. So the older people get skin cancers, such as non-melanoma skin cancers and lymphomas. They get wounds. Uh, because we're in a city, we get tertiary, uh, uh, excuse me, inner city diseases, people who neglect themselves, infectious diseases. And we see lots of uh, patients of uh, skin of color uh, because of our location. Because we're the only major academic dermatology program, we get tertiary and quaternary care, the toughest cases, specialty care for you to learn from. And we also pride ourselves in taking care of the sickest patients. We maintain an inpatient unit where sometimes we admit patients to ourselves, sometimes they're admitted to uh, hospitalists or internal medicine teams, but we take care of the sickest. We believe that if somebody has the worst skin disease, they should be cared for by a dermatologist and not relegated to other specialties. You'll hear more about the various sites of training from Dr. Morrison uh, in some detail, uh, but we have both a university hospital, we have a, a federal hospital, the VA, we have a county hospital in Jackson Memorial Hospital, and then we have a community house, the hospital, Mount Sinai Medical Center. So you really get a diversity of experience when you train at the University of Miami. I mentioned the idea of scholarship and the ability to contribute to the knowledge base of dermatology. Currently, our program is, is that uh, even before you start here, we, d we let you know of our research teams that exist. And we ask you to join a research team so that during your first year, you get to learn who our researchers are, but how a research team works. During that first year, then you'll decide if you wanna do a research project, whether it's a clinical research project or a laboratory research project, and you can go on to the clinical research or laboratory research track. Or if you uh, prefer to do a clinician educator track. So, and all of them require some degree of scholarship and submission uh, of uh, articles for publication. You'll hear more about that from Dr. Mariana Tomich, our vice uh, chair of, uh, of research. And we have uh, many opportunities to present the research data. We've, over the last four years, we've had a dedicated annual research day, the Cecilia and Samuel Resnick Research Day. This past year, we had to go virtual, uh, but this is an opportunity for uh, the trainees to present their uh, research findings uh, in a formalized process. Many of our trainees speak at national and even international meetings, and you'll hear more about that uh, during this open house. So what we wanna do in this open house is begin to teach you about our program so that we, we, we start the process of finding the right fit. Uh, many of you are gonna be uh, dermatologists and go to different uh, 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 training programs in the country, but we're really looking for the fit between you and us. So as you go and hear about our uh, program through this open house, uh, we want to ask, is this the right fit for you? And if you want to be a uh, part of a great team, a team that's growing, uh, uh, there's energy and vibrancy to the, because we're of our growth, if you're willing to work hard and put in the effort, you will become a great dermatologist and the city of Miami allows for great fun. If you wanna to reach to greatest heights, be among our alumni who have made a difference outside of their own walls and be a difference maker, then the Frost Department is for you. If you wanna take care of the sickest patients, the most challenging patients, if you wanna provide the highest level of care, then the Frost Department is for you. If you wanna to contribute to the knowledge base of dermatology and learn how to innovate so that you can make a greater impact than just seeing one patient, make an impact beyond, beyond the walls of uh, the clinic, then UM Frost Dermatology is for you. And if you wanna live in an exciting, vibrant, and multicultural city, then UM Frost Dermatology is for you. So I wanna thank you for joining us in this open house. And um, we look forward to the question and answer period at the end of the formal videos and presentations. Welcome. Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Morrison. I'm the Associate Program Director at the Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I'm also the Director of the Jackson Memorial Outpatient Services. And uh, thank you for joining us today uh, and giving me the opportunity to discuss 
some of our resident teaching sites, as well as an overview of the curriculum and what we have to offer our trainees. So Dr. Kersner briefly reviewed these already, um, and these are a few or the four primary training sites that uh, our residents go to. So let's talk about each of them. So we will start with Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is our primary teaching site. It is the public hospital for Miami-Dade County, a very large urban community with a diverse patient population. The hospital is the primary site uh, for training our, our underserved in the community. It has a very strong inpatient consult service and a number of specialty clinics, including a surgical clinic, Hansen's disease, which is the only one in the state, a hair and nail clinic, as well as a biologic clinic, where we provide free uh, biologic therapies to patients with psoriasis, um, as well as a pediatric dermatology clinic. Our next training site is the Miami VA Hospital, and this is the primary referral center for all of South Florida. So from Broward County all the way down to Key West and Monroe, they come to us at the Miami VA. Uh, it's a predominantly a geriatric population, and because of that, we see a lot of skin cancer um, and medical dermatology, and it's also one of our primary surgical training sites because of the high burden of, of skin malignancy. We have a very uh, strong inpatient consult service here as well, and a satellite clinic in Broward, which is the county north of Miami, about a 40-minute drive. And we have some specialty clinics, including an HIV lipoatrophy clinic, where we use Sculptra to help um, improve the aesthetic appearance with, of patients with HIV lipoatrophy, as well as a laser clinic. Our next training site is the University of Miami Hospital. So this houses our dermatology inpatient service and consult service. So here at this hospital, we admit patients directly to dermatology. We are the primary service. Um, and provide care for these patients as hospitalized patients. It also houses our wound care clinic. It's the primary site for our private attending clinics. Um, and by virtue of where we are here in South Florida, it also has a very diverse patient population. And we see patients with Medicaid and insurances that many private practices will not see. Uh, and we have a number of satellite clinics, including the Lennar Foundation on the main UM campus, as well as some, some uh, smaller uh, private practice like feeling clinics in South Miami, Coral Gables, and Miami Beach. Uh, part of the University of Miami is Sylvester Cancer or Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, which houses our MOSE services as well as an inpatient oncodermatology consult service. And our specialty clinic here is our pigmented lesion or melanoma clinic. Last but not least is Mount Sinai Medical, Medical Center. And this is a community hospital on Miami Beach uh, where our trainees, predominantly third year residents, spend a good deal of time with Dr. Martin Zayek doing surgical Mohs and aesthetic dermatology. We also are responsible for covering the inpatient consultations at this location. So as you can see, we have quite a number of training sites. And as Dr. Kurzer mentioned, quite a large clinical faculty. So because of that, we have many specialty clinics, including an acne rosacea clinic with Dr. Kirai, connective tissue disease clinic with Dr. Matterall, cosmetics with Dr. Who, myself, and Rosen, hair diseases with Dr. Midova and Tosti, Hansen's disease with Dr. Matterall, which I mentioned is the only one in the state, hydroenitis depurativa with Drs. Levtov and Nichols. We have our inpatient dermatology service with Dr. Kurzer, which is one of the only ones in the country, itch with Dr. Yosipovich, nails with Tosti, Zayek, and myself, patch testing with Dr. Tossi and Franca, pediatric dermatology and genodermatoses with Dr. Schachner, Schmidt, and Gonzalez, pigmented lesions with Dr. Hymas and Hu, the psoriasis biologic clinic, which I mentioned to you at Jackson, Mohs surgery with Drs. Nuri, Tang, and Rosen, skin of color with Dr. Willary Lloyd, though I'd like to mention that all of the faculty see a very large proportion of patients of color just, again, by being in Miami. Uh, and of course, ulcer and wound healing with Dr. Kersner and Levtov. So I'm going to briefly review some of the clinical rotations by year that our, our residents have. So our first year residents spend a good amount of time on the inpatient service at the University of Miami Hospital. They also work at our Jackson clinics and do surgery there, the VA clinics and doing surgery at the VA. They help cover Mount Sinai. They rotate through the wound healing service. They spend some time at the University of Miami uh, clinics as well as our Sylvester clinics, um, and they help run the Hansen service. 
second year residents spend a little more time in specialized dermatology. So they have a dermatopathology rotation, Mohs surgery, they spend some time in our satellite clinics like South Miami, Lennar, and Coral Gables. They rotate through our pediatric clinics. They help provide post care for our patients. They rotate through the melanoma service, and then they spend time at both the Broward and Miami VA clinics and also doing surgery. Our third year residents um, have a lot more autonomy and provide a more supervisor sort of role um, and leadership role. So we have a third year as a Jackson chief, VA chief, um, inpatient consult services at Jackson, which has a number of very complex medical dermatology cases. They have a cosmetics rotation. They have a rotation with Dr. Zayek at Mount Sinai. They spend some time at the UMH clinics. And then we also give them elective time to pursue personal interests and research projects. Here is an example of what you would expect for our didactics. Of course, it changes from week to week. So, you know, a rough estimate on maybe uh, two couple days a week in the morning, there'll be textbook reviews. Every day around noon, we have a didactic lecture. So on Monday would be Kodachromes, Tuesday pathology review with Dr. Elgart. On Thursday, you would have a surgical lecture, a faculty lecture, dermatopathology, Friday faculty lecture, derm unknown or a journal club. Uh, Wednesday morning is our departmental academic time. So uh, in the past, what would happen is we would arrive at eight o'clock, have live patient viewings, and then discuss the cases in our management conference at nine o'clock. That's all been shifted to virtual for the time being. Um, so we start around nine o'clock to see our patients and discuss them. And then this is followed by grand rounds. Some evenings we also have didactic lectures. So on, uh, for example, this past Tuesday, we, there was an evening germ path session. Um, once a month on Wednesday, Dr. Kersner meets with the residents, discuss any changes in the, the department and get hear any concerns they might have. And then every two months, we have something called the Miami Dermatology Society, and it is a uh, society meeting for our community, both academic and private practice. And so our first year residents present interesting cases uh, to the community physicians and faculty. We all discuss it together. And then afterwards, we would all go out to dinner and have a lecture of someone from someone of, of some renown. Um, and it was a great fun. Of course, this is virtual for the time being, but we expect it to resume in the future. So a little bit about call. Uh, so our, our call is home call, and it's covered by first and second year residents on weeknights. Um, and they're responsible for covering the University of Miami Hospital in Jackson. There's a first year resident who covers Mount Sinai and another first year who covers the Veterans Hospital. Weekend call is covered by the first year who's on the inpatient service. Um, we do occasionally have Saturday morning clinics and then holiday, is call, holiday calls split equally amongst all the first year residents. And there's always someone for backup, whether it be the Jackson consult resident, chief residents or any of our faculty, um, we're all available 24 seven to help take care of our patients, which is our priority here. So our residents are, are encouraged to attend conferences, both regional, national, and international. So besides the AAD and ASDS conferences, our, our residents often go to the Florida Society of Dermatology and Derm Dermatologic Surgery, the Florida Society of Dermatologic Surgery, the South Beach Symposium here in Miami, um, which has the Masters of Pediatric, Pediatrics in it, um, ODAC, the annual symposium for advanced wound care, real world dermatology in Las Vegas, where the residents often go with Dr. Kersner to that one, uh, integrative dermatology, and then of course, the hair, nail, and cosmetic conference in Sorrento uh, that's run by Dr. Tosti. And we're also very much committed to community service. So besides my own personal clinical and educational outreach in Haiti, where many residents have gone with me on trips or are currently involved in projects related to that, we, uh, we also help volunteer at Camilla's House, which is the local homeless shelter where we provide a once monthly uh, dermatology clinic free of charge to the, the patients there. Uh, there are a number of health fairs throughout South Florida going all the way to Key West that we attend, as well as the SunSmart uh, Sprint to the 5K race to help raise money for skin cancer research. Um, our residents are employees of the Public Health Trust, which is Jackson Memorial Hospital. They can join the union. They have very generous uh, meal allowance from both the, the, uh, Jackson and the University of Miami. They have discounted parking. They have a significant educational reimbursement yearly, four weeks of vacation, wonderful medical, dental, and mental health insurance with a good prescription plan, 
disability, life insurance, and a very competitive salary for our location here in South Florida. So the main key takeaway points that I'd like to have, for all of you to have is that, of course, we have a very large clinical faculty with numerous areas of expertise. We have superb clinical and surgical training in a setting that encourages a resident to have autonomy over time with experience. Uh, we have a very diverse patient population encompassing all ages, gender identities, ethnicities, sex, skin types, sexual orientations, religions. Uh, and we provide our trainees exposure to the practice of dermatology in a variety of institutions and clinical settings from a public hospital setting to a private practice like feel in the community. So thank you all for your attention. Um, and please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Kevan Nuri. I'm the Director of Moles and Dermatologic Surgery at Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. This is the first department country that actually added the name Cutaneous Surgery to its name. It's one of the premier programs in the country training dermatology residents in all aspects of dermatologic surgery, including moles, reconstructive surgery, lasers, and cosmetic. Hi, this is Dr. Lauren Schackner. I've been doing pediatric dermatology at Miami for a long time. Uh, should you uh, match with us and do your residency during your first year, you'll have uh, clinical outpatient exposure with Dr. Schmidt and I, the Jackson Clinic, and you'll be involved with some of the consults. The second year, you'll have dedicated time of several months to work intensely with us on pediatric dermatology. And in the third year, you're going to have all the pederm consults all to yourself with some supervision. So you'll have a very rich experience in pederm should we have the good fortune of having you join us in Miami. All the best. Hi, I'm Fernanda Schmidt and I'm one of the pediatric dermatologists of the department. This is the Mailman Center, one of the places where I practice. Here at Mailman, we hold daily pediatric clinics which are part of the residence rotations. We see a variety of skin diseases and also have the opportunity to collaborate with other pediatric subspecialties. This makes Mailman a great place for training and learning. So I hope you enjoyed my little tour and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the end of these. Hello, I'm Dr. Galimberti. I recently joined the faculty uh, here in Miami. I actually did my residency here and I loved it. I love the collegiality and cutting edge approach to dermatology in this very international department that I decided to stay. My clinical interests are in complex medical dermatology as well as oncodermatology. And regarding my research, I'm interested in uh, skin manifestation of systemic diseases, as well as patient safety and understanding the side effect of medications, particularly the biologics. I interact with the residents mostly in my clinic, as well as by volunteering my time at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And I'm looking forward to seeing you here. Hi, I'm Andrea Matterall, and uh, I'm really lucky. I get to spend a lot of time with the residents. I wear a lot of different clinical hats. So I direct our Hansen's disease program, and I get to work with you during your first year when you rotate through there. I also direct our connective tissue disease uh, clinic. And so I'll get to work with you guys in my private clinic, seeing these challenging cases. And then during your third year, I also help to direct our Jackson consult service and get to work with you all then. Um, it really is an amazing place to train and I look forward to meeting you all in the future. Hi, I'm Jennifer Tang. I'm one of three full-time Mo surgeons at the University of Miami. I practice on the main medical campus as well as in two of our Durham satellites and Coral Gables in South Miami. I will get a chance to work with you guys um, in your first year at the Jackson Surgery Clinic, as well as in your dedicated Mohs surgery rotation as a second year. Uh, clinically, I practice mostly Mohs surgery, and I'm particularly interested in the um, complex reconstruction of large tumors. And research-wise, I am interested in the, um, the management and treatment of uh, locally advanced unresectable cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, and I look forward to meeting you all via Zoom. Hi, my name is Dr. Alex Rosen Aiken, and I'm Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of Miami, Dr. Philip Frost, Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery. I specialize in Mohs micrographic surgery, cosmetic dermatology, as well as general dermatology. I'm excited to meet all of you and hope that you enjoy learning a little bit more about our dermatology program here in Miami. Hello, I'm Dr. Tosti, and uh, I'm an expert in hair and nail disorders. So if you join our department, you will learn how to diagnose and treat hair and nails from me. And you will 
also probably uh, enjoy being uh, invited in my house where I always organize party for our residents. Hello, my name is Andy Blavelt. I was a resident at the University of Miami um, from 1989 to 1992. Um, I love being a resident in Miami. Um, saw tons of things that I would have never seen in any other type of training. I saw leprosy patients, I saw HIV AIDS patients, lots of skin cancer, unusual things, lots of memories from my training during that time. Um, and as far as my career goes, um, that my experience with HIV AIDS patients led to me doing research in that area and becoming a world expert in HIV AIDS in the dermatology community. Um, it was critical for my future success. And then another big thing that happened is I met another University of Miami alumnus while I was a second year resident, Dr. Steve Katz, who many of you know is one of the most famous um, alumni from University of Miami. Um, he became my mentor at the NIH and influenced my career greatly. So my time at Miami was awesome and influenced my life greatly. Um, I'm prone to say that um, if you train in Miami, it doesn't matter what time, what era, you're going to come out being a great dermatologist. It's just a wonderful place to train. And I want to give a shout out to Rob Kirstner for carrying the torch forward in a very positive way. Um, I love what's happening in the department and um, he's continuing the great tradition that you have there uh, in, in dermatology at the University of Miami. So kudos to Rob and um, thanks to University of Miami for such great training. Bye. Hello everybody. My name is Erin Way. I am currently starting my fifth year on faculty at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, where I serve as the director of the blistering disease program and the Westwood outpatient clinic. Um, now that I'm in my fifth year of practice, um, I can confidently say that my residency training really prepared me for my current role. Um, Miami has not only one of the busiest and the largest academic training programs in the country, in my opinion, it has one of the best faculty. I was so incredibly lucky to train with some of the best in medical, pediatric, surgical, cosmetic dermatology, and pathology. And Miami draws upon such an incredible patient population, ranging from the indigent population at Jackson to the veterans at the VA to the private patients at the university. It is because of this incredible training, I felt like my transition to my current position was seamless. I have no doubt, no matter what area of dermatology you choose, and in whatever forum, whether it be private, academic, or a hybrid, Miami will prepare you for your career. And I wish you the best of luck this interview season, and I hope you're as lucky as I was to train in Miami. Hello, my name is Anthony Fernandez. I am the Director of Medical Dermatology and a Dermatopathologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And I can tell you that the training you will receive as a dermatology resident at the University of Miami is as good as you will get anywhere in the entire world. By the time I graduated, I was confident that I could handle any patient and any problem that walked through my door. And I also felt that my training prepared me to prescribe any medication you could imagine you may use in dermatology at an adequate dose not only with confidence, but also with an adequate amount of caution. And I know that my career and my clinical decision making has benefited every single day from the training I received at the University of Miami. And I enjoyed tremendously my time in Miami, the people I trained with, my colleagues, my mentors and teachers, and my patients. And I can remember when I graduated telling the audience during my speech that no matter where I practiced, the Department of Dermatology at the University of Miami would always be home. And I can sincerely say that years later, even though I am very happy to be practicing at the Cleveland Clinic, the Department of Dermatology at the University of Miami is and always will be home. 
I'm Sharon Jacob. I trained at the University of Miami Dermatology program in 2004. I had the fortune of training with Bill Eaglestein, Dick Taylor, Ann Burdick, Rob Kirshner, Francisco Cardell, Richard Feinstein, Gunther Kahn, and Leslie Bauman. All of these people taught me to learn. Hi, I'm Bill Eaglestein. I probably have known the Department of Dermatology at Miami and the graduates for a longer period of time than anyone you're going to hear from today. In fact, until for 18 years until 2005, I was the department chairman. Before that, I had been the chairman of dermatology at the University of Pittsburgh. And before that, I had been um, a dermatologist in the Navy, and uh, I actually trained at the University of Miami in 1965. You don't need to worry about figuring this out. I'm 104 years old. <laughs> but seriously, I do think if you train at Miami, you'll become a fabulous dermatologist. It's not only the uh, caseload that you've heard about or will hear about and the outstanding faculty, but it's the traditions of Miami. Two stand out that I wanted to mention. One is that at Miami, you'll learn to think like a dermatologist. You'll learn to think about medicine largely because the faculty will ask you a lot of questions and encourage you to think through the problems. And in fact, uh, often Miami faculty had said they teach questions, not answers. And the other tradition that will help make you a fantastic dermatologist is that at Miami, you'll be allowed to contribute information to the pile of knowledge called dermatology. Uh, the residents are allowed to do clinical and preclinical research projects, and almost all end up publishing a number of papers which add to the pile of knowledge called dermatology. So I hope you will rank Miami very high, and I think if you train there, you'll be very lucky and become a fantastic dermatologist. Thank you. I'm Jeff McBride, one of the recent graduates from the class of 2020. I'm currently doing my Derm Path Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, but I miss my training already in, in Miami. It was a great time. I had so many mentors from clinical to research to dermatopathology. There was no shortage of being able to find someone to talk to and someone to learn from. You know, whether it be seeing complex medical dermatology patients with Dr. Elgard or Dr. Kirshner in Jackson Memorial Hospital or the University of Miami inpatient service, sitting at the scope with Dr. Romanelli and Dr. Elgard and seeing challenging derm path cases, and doing adult mesenchymal stem cell research and looking at the role of extracellular vesicles in skin wound healing and regeneration. All of these experience, experiences were very special to me, and I don't regret making Miami my number one choice to go to residency. And I know that if you choose University of Miami Department of Dermatology as your number one choice, you won't regret it. So I wish you all the best in the interview season and I hope that you seriously consider making the University of Miami your place to train and learn dermatology. Hey everyone, this is uh, Dr. Terrence Keeney, a board certified dermatologist in Washington, D.C. And congratulations to getting an interview at the best dermatology program in the country, University of Miami, where I trained and graduated in 2012. Uh, my experience in Miami was, you know, bar none, the best training you could possibly get. Uh, you have a huge faculty that has research focus, clinical focus. Um, you have a, you know, a wealth of mentors to choose from. Uh, and the mentorship was a, really the truly most important part of my residency. Uh, you know, I still quote to residents that I teach today, you know, the most important thing I learned in Miami is be an expert, find your niche, and, and, and Miami allows you to develop that. And that's really been instrumental in my career where I've gone on to publish and do a lot of work in, uh, in uh, gender differences in dermatology and aesthetics and has allowed me to move on and start my own practice and, and participate in clinical research. So, you know, my training was bar none, but also the mentorship I think is truly underrated and having such a large uh, faculty that really covers all aspects of dermatology. You're going to find someone uh, at the uh, University of Miami uh, that can allow you to grow into your career and always be there for you. I still keep in touch with all my co-residents and faculty, so uh, you couldn't be at a better place. I hope you uh, take the time out to enjoy it. 
uh, and really, uh, and, and good luck with your interview. Take care. Go to you. Hi, I'm Alan Zoe, and I'm an assistant professor of dermatology at Northwestern. UM Derm has one of the best, if not the absolute best, dermatology training program. In some places, you will read about rare skin diseases in textbooks. At UM, you will actually see them in person, probably multiple times. You will have great teachers and mentors that will get you where you want to be. It's probably why it has a track record for training some of the most prominent dermatologists in the world. It certainly helped my career where I now specialize in cutaneous lymphomas and complex medical dermatology. Hello and welcome to Miami. Digitally, of course, we wish we could have welcomed you here in person, but wanted to give you a little perspective of what it's like to live here in the city of Miami as a resident here in the Department of Dermatology. So let's go take a look. Miami is a wonderful place to live, and we're going to take you on a little tour digitally through some of the parts of Miami that we would have loved to show you if you were down here in person for the interviews. Here we've got some views from the downtown area and historic Freedom Tower. And here's a view of Brickell. This is the main city area that many of our residents live in, and even some of us live in the high rises here in the shot. Coral Gables is another popular area, better for families and larger home sizes that you can live in and rent out. And then South Beach is also a very common spot. These are the main areas that many of the residents live, and here's another shot of Brickell in the downtown area, which is extremely walkable. Many of our residents don't even use their cars if they have a car at all, and you can really walk to go get groceries, walk to any store, walk to a gym if you need it, and it's a very convenient area. Hi, I'm Ella. I'm one of the first year residents at University of Miami, and I wanted to talk to you about the different housing options. Some of us live in Brickell, I would say the majority of us, which is called the financial district, and there's a lot of high rises that are very affordable. I would say 90% of us live within a 10 minute walking distance of each other. And then people live in Miami Beach where they have quick access to the water. And some people live in Edgewater where they have these amazing ocean views for very cheap. And I want to give you a little taste of what it's like. So I want to show you around my apartment in Brickell. So we can start with my office. This is where I do the majority of my studying, reading dermatology, and I even have a little pull-out mattress for guests. And then for all you New Yorkers, this is one of the most exciting things to you guys, this built-in wash and dryer, which most of the buildings have. Here's my kitchen, which I use a lot. My dining room, my living room. And then I wanted to highlight probably the best part about living in Miami are the views. You can see the city and you can also see the ocean. And I love waking up to this every morning. And then last is my bedroom. And then I also have my bathroom if you really want to see it. Hi everyone, I'm Liz, one of the first years. I just had a fascinating day in clinic and now I'm about to go for a relaxing swim in the ocean. After that, I'll come back I'll eat dinner out here on my deck and then do some reading here as well. Needless to say, our lives here in Miami are amazing. There's constant sunshine, access to water, tons of things to do outside, and then of course, just incredible training. I cannot recommend this program enough. Miami is a beautiful city, and this would be a view if you were flying in for the interviews. All these other shots are just taken on an iPhone randomly throughout the city, and we could go on and on about the scenic beauty of this town, but we'd rather show you in person. One of the ways I stay connected to myself and to the city of Miami is by going on a daily constitutional, and that's pretty easy when living on Miami Beach. 
Okay, I am a current first year. Coming from New York, I really wanted to live in a city with the same amount of activity and diversity, and so far Miami really fits that bill. The whole city just moves with rhythm from the chill tones of Coconut Grove to the fiery salsa of Calle Ocho. I can always find a vibe that fits my mood. There is no shortage of fun activities to do while you're here in Miami, from kiteboarding, surfing, occasionally, Plenty of stand-up paddleboarding, great cycling with the colleagues, wakeboarding as well, very accessible, and of course, deep sea fishing. Don't worry, we threw all these fish back, including this shark that was caught. You can play basketball pretty accessibly, tennis, and even run the Miami Marathon, or just mess around with colleagues over on the beach. Whether it's the beach or anything ever in the water, taking advantage of the amazing art and music scene here in Miami, or attending sports and international events like Art Basel. Whatever you're looking for, Miami's got something to offer. Hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm currently the co-chief resident, and this is my little guy, Winnie. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about why Miami's such an amazing place to be a dog mom. We get to take amazing, lovely walks several times a day along beautiful waterways such as this, along the uh, Miami Bay. And it's an amazing time for us to bond and relax. And also, Miami's such a dog-friendly place. There's so many dog beaches, parks, and restaurants that accommodate us. It's really a true joy to be a dog mom here. Pets make the best study companions, and Miami apartments have a lot of space, so it's a great place to have one. One of the classic pilgrimages from Miami is down to the Florida Keys, where we do an annual health fair together, and we do skin checks and skin cancer screenings for the population down there. We make sure to hang out with the rest of the team after hours and of course, grab a world famous key lime pie. First year at UM right now. Although it's only been a couple of months, I'm so excited and so happy that I chose to come to this program. Honestly, here, we see things that most other people in other programs will never get to see. Like we have our own, the leprosy clinic or the inpatient dermatology service here. Hi, I'm Eric Miranda, a third year resident. My favorite part of Miami is the culinary scene. Hands down, Miami is the magic city for food. Whether you want an acai bowl before a jog or tapas on the beach with a DJ, there's something for everyone. And when you come to Miami, you're gonna quickly fall in love with the restaurants as I have. Music, art, and fashion are a quintessential element of Miami culture. And there's really great access to many different galleries, art museums, art events, and music events throughout the city. Hey guys, my name is John Zaid. Uh, I'm a senior resident at Miami. I want to tell you a little bit about your activities that you can do in this city. Um, I mean, there really is a breadth of activities for whatever your interests are, whether it's art and art Basel, uh, if you're an outdoors person, some of the best fishing in the world. Uh, the music scene is also great through uh, Ultra, uh, Orpichobi Fest, whatever you know your music interests are. And of course the sports. We have some of the best sports teams in the heat. Um, Marlins aren't so great, but you know you can find the sports as well. So there's a lot of great activities to do, and I'm sure you're going to have fun in Miami. Um, I hope to see you guys soon on the ground. As a die-hard Los Angeles Lakers fan myself, I've been very impressed with Miami as an athletic city. Dr. Romanelli here and I going to the Lakers heat game and plenty of great access to sporting events for all the residents. With very accessible stadiums, reasonable pricing, and some of the greatest sports moments. Back in out to Allen, history title, bang! Tie game with five seconds remaining! Dr. Elgard even invites all the residents to come out to some of the Miami Marlins games and the Miami Heat games together. It's a great experience with the colleagues and occasionally we'll make it out to a Miami Hurricanes football game too. The stadiums were so nice, even the Super Bowl was here. So I really hope that you consider us and consider joining the UM family. Hi, I'm Corinne, one of the current dermatology residents. I live here in Miami with my husband and my dog, Teddy. We moved here a few years ago and got married during that time. It's been a great place to live. Uh, I think whether you're single, a young couple, or have a larger family, there's a lot to do here outdoors and indoors. There's a lot of opportunities for exercise, the beach, parks, and boating, um, as well as great food and restaurants and many other things to do. We hope that you come here. 
Hi, I'm Felita. I'm one of the third year residents, and I'm both a resident and a mommy. There's me in my Let's give that And the Yoshi of Miami. We are skin doctors. Yay! Hey everyone, my name is Josh Mervis. I'm one of the first year dermatology residents. I'm checking in here from the inpatient service. Um, it's a busy service. You spend a good amount of time here your first year, but you see absolutely incredible things. I guarantee you won't see anything more interesting anywhere else you go. So we hope to see you down here in Miami in the near future. And you'll have the best time training with your colleagues. My favorite thing about training at Miami, probably my number one reason for coming here, is the fact that not only are you working with uh, faculty members that are quite honestly world experts in their fields, with Dr. Kersner in wounds, Dr. Schachner in pediatrics, Dr. Yosipovich in itch, Dr. Tosti in hair, but these are all faculty members that are incredibly personable, charismatic, they're funny, they love working with residents, and it's such a positive experience in clinic every single day with them. You end up spending so much quality time with your colleagues, with your co-residents, with the faculty. They're one of the most beautiful parts about this program is when they stop becoming colleagues and really start becoming family, like this guy. <laughs> but when you get called in in the middle of the night, they're the same people that will have your back. You'll celebrate birthdays together. Holidays together. And even weddings together. And of course, graduation. And possibly one of the best parts about this program is it doesn't end at graduation. It's a family that lasts a lifetime, and we hope we can welcome you all into it. Hello, I'm Henri Ford. Dean of the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine. Welcome to the University of Miami and Jackson Health System, where graduate medical education is unlike anywhere else in the world. Our partnership in medical training gives you access to unmatched clinical experience, cutting edge researchers, and innovative educational programs. At the U, we empower our residents and fellows to transform lives, and we inspire them to serve our global community as we train them to become the next generation of physician scientists, transformational leaders, and educators. So if you want to train in a vibrant, dynamic, and diverse environment where you can make a difference in the lives of your patients, your colleagues, your community, and the future of medicine, then the UM Jackson residencies, as well as our fellowships, are exactly where you need to be. We look forward to seeing you at the U. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at our virtual open house. Again, I'm Dr. Brian Morrison. I'm one of the program directors here, and I am joined by my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Kersner and Dr. Elgart. Gentlemen, would you introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, again, I'm Robert Kersner. I'm uh, the chair and Harvey Blank professor, and I'm thrilled that you all joined us tonight. I'm George Elgart. I'm the uh, program director here and uh, happy to have you here. Thank you, gentlemen. So we're here to help answer some questions you might have about our program. So please submit them through the Q&A um, box down at the bottom. And before the event, a few pro uh, questions were submitted to us already. So we'll start with those while we wait for more questions to come in. So um, the first question, I think, for you, Dr. Kersner, what have been the biggest changes in the program in the last five years and what do you anticipate to be changing 
in the next five. So as I, uh, as I pointed out uh, in the presentation, we've had dramatic growth over the last five years. We've doubled the size of our uh, faculty in both our clinical and research aspects. We have expanded from being completely on our medical campus to satellite practices in the community. Um, and that gives an opportunity for the residents to have a greater uh, chance to uh, work with the, the best in, uh, in the world in, in clinical dermatology, and also experience a spectrum of care settings uh, from uh, the university and medical center patients to patients who are in the community. I expect that to continue to some extent over the next uh, five years. I don't expect we'll double the size of the department again, but we're gonna continue to grow the department. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, recruit both uh, established people who will uh, enhance our existing programs. For, for example, I expect that our cutaneous oncology program will grow over the next few years. And we'll also recruit, recruit junior people who will become uh, the superstars and leaders of dermatology for generations to come. Some of them will be our own residents that will have uh, stay on faculty. So when you get here, I expect that our program will be even grander and greater and have more things to offer. For example, uh, the testing program will, um, will be in place where we'll be testing topical treatments that will go on as uh, pharmaceuticals or cosmeceuticals. Um, we'll uh, have, uh, likely have a, a hair transplant surgeon uh, as part of our faculty, so you'll be able to experience that and, and, and augment our already spectacular um, uh, hair efforts. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Kersner. Um, here's another question that was submitted prior to the event. So uh, I'll let you answer this one, Dr. Elgart. The question is, what kind of residents are we looking for? Uh, what, well, the easiest thing to say is uh, we're looking for terrific residents, but I, I always say I, I don't want them all the same. We're not looking for one flavor of resident, one particular kind of resident. I think uh, I always say the residents are like snowflakes. They're, they're all a little bit different. And the ones that, uh, uh, ha show those differences either in their interests or in their focus or uh, really in their personalities. I think all those things matter. So we're really looking for a diverse group. We'd like to have a bunch of different uh, people with different interests. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm not so excited about whether you want to have an academic career. That's great. It's a great place to train for that. If, if you want to have a private practice career, it's, terrific place to train for that. If you're going to do a subspecialty, you want to go to a place where you have a great training uh, so that because you may not be doing a lot of general dermatology after that. So you certainly get that here. Uh, but the person I'm looking for, you know, I thought about this a long time. And the person I'm looking for is somebody who loves dermatology. And those people have a great time at University of Miami and, and uh, Jackson Memorial Program. And I think uh, if you love dermatology, give us, give us a look. Thank you so much for that. In fact, you, I think you already started answering the next question, um, which we had was what kind of residents do well at our program? What kind of people don't do well? And I think you answered it perfectly well that the, you know, the trainees who love dermatology typically are the ones who really thrive in our, in our program. Um, because they're the ones who take advantage of all the opportunities that our large clinical research faculty have to offer. Um, as well, they also, are, you know, we have a pretty busy clinical service at all of our training sites. And so these are usually trainees who are, like to see patients, they want to see patients. Um, so I think those are the ones that do really well with us. As far as ones who don't uh, do as well, um, Typically, trainees who maybe went into it more for lifestyle reasons, maybe they're not so keen on seeing a lot of patients. I don't know, gentlemen, what, what else do you think makes for a, a resident that does well in our program? Yeah, I've always said that if you're, if you're a go-getter, if you're motivated, uh, you do better in anything that you do. And certainly that's true in our program. And uh, I would just say, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons to do dermatology and they're all valid. But if you, if you want to have fun every day, then you're going to have fun if you're doing something you love. So I, I just focus on, on that and uh, hope if you love dermatology, you'll think about us. 
And uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but I agree 100%. It's uh, uh, the uh, self-starters, uh, the people that look for opportunities, uh, the people that um, uh, understand that um, it's a combination of an opportunity and then what you make of the opportunity is, uh, are the ones that uh, do the best and go on to really impactful careers in dermatology. Thank you so much. So I'm scrolling through now the, the new questions we have, and it seems like quite a few of them are uh, in regards to uh, international med medical graduates and wh whether or not we um, you know, consider them for residency position. And so I'll just say it uh, that we definitely do. In fact, one of our second year residents is an international medical graduate. Um, and some of the questions ask for very specifics about what we're looking for. It's hard to say, you know, uh, we do a holistic review of all of our applicants, including the international medical graduates. And so there is no specific uh, thing or box that you can check off to, to get yourself into our program, but we do look at your application and we do consider you for a position. So moving on to some of the other questions. So the next question is, how often do residents stay on to be faculty? Well, I'm one of them. <laughs> Dr. Kersner, how often would you say these days? Yeah, so I think that um, uh, about a third of our residents go on to do fellowships, about a third go on directly to academic careers, and a third uh, go on to practice. And uh, I would say that every year we take uh, uh, several uh, residents onto faculty in the last number of years. Certainly some of them join as a full-time faculty, and you met some of them uh, on the videos, Dr. Agin, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Madaral, uh, are, 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 uh, are among them. Uh, but then we also have this uh, program for uh, part-time uh, physicians who, um, who come back to the, the department and see patients in the department. And we have uh, uh, some residents over the past few years that have joined the department in that way. So there are ample opportunities. And I think as our, our department continues to grow, uh, certainly in the foreseeable fu future, those opportunities will, be, uh, will continue. Wonderful. So our next question is with the Hansen's Disease Clinic and having patients from the Caribbean, South Central America, I'm sure you have extensive global health opportunities. Do residents take advantage of this? So I think I can help answer this. So they most certainly do. Um, I have a personal relationship and outreach with the only academic hospital in Haiti in the city of Port-au-Prince. Uh, and uh, residents very frequently join me on my trips to Haiti. They're involved in a number of the projects. Uh, involving telemedicine, um, as well as improving access to care in Haiti. We have faculty also in uh, Ecuador. Um, so there, there are a number of, of opportunities through our program um, specifically that uh, our residents do take advantage of. So the next question is, I think a good one for you, Dr. Uh, Elgart. Do residents get the chance to study and see slides of the biopsies they perform to establish a form of clinical pathologic correlation? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's part of what goes on here, and we really encourage it. Uh, the last few days, several people have brought me a case to go over that they've seen at one of our institutions. We, we actually have a number of different uh, derm path services that go on here because the individual hospitals by regulation have to have their own, but we work very closely and are very well connected with uh, the Jackson Memorial Hospital, with the University of Miami Hospital, and uh, uh, we actually interact with, with all of our uh, hospitals in the medical center. And, and residents come all the time uh, showing, showing us cases and uh, uh, build their uh, clinical pathologic correlation. I, I, wherever you go, if you do a biopsy, it's a great idea to look at it under the microscope. If it's not a little tag or something, uh, you can learn something from every case. Perfect. Thank you. So our next question, um, how do you ensure diversity amongst the residents accepted into your program? Uh, so, you know, diversity is an extremely important uh, topic uh, and initiative, both for our university department, but also the specialty at large. So the way that we help ensure diversity amongst our residents is to try to interview a fairly large percentage of uh, persons of color and underrepresented minorities 
um, to help improve the likelihood of them matching into our program. Um, and this is what a lot of different programs are doing across the board. Anything else, gentlemen, you'd like to add to that? Well, it's a, it's a match. So, you know, you can never be sure exactly who you're going to get. Uh, but I think we, we try, as, as uh, Brian was mentioning, to do a very holistic review. If, if you send in an application to us, we're going to read the application. And uh, so there's that step. Then the other step is we are looking for people, uh, all different kinds of uh, residents and, and people from every background. And, you know, we, we will try and uh, uh, attract you. And then the other half is on you. So if you're a little different, let us know. And uh, that, that sometimes helps us to appreciate where you would fit in and how you'd, uh, uh, how you'd make the program better and stronger. And we're, we're definitely looking for a strong program. And I want to make sure that everybody who's listening right now understands that diversity is very, very important to us. And I want to highlight, as uh, Dr. Morrison mentioned earlier, we have a, a skin of color division where we have three uh, faculty members that are involved in taking care of uh, uh, issues in, of skin of color. We all take care of patients of color, but there's a specific specialty here. We do a lot of work in, um, in disparities, uh, and we've done so for uh, well over a decade, trying to uh, reverse the disparities that in, in healthcare uh, that occurs. And, um, and as, uh, just, uh, just today, for example, in our faculty meeting, we discuss ways that we can have better uh, uh, racial uh, justice and equality. And the faculty is going to take on a number of initiatives um, to, um, to in, continue to improve upon uh, these issues. So we're taking it seriously, uh, and, um, and we're going to do our best while, as Dr. Elgar mentioned, we can't ensure. We're going to do uh, the best to assure that we have a chance to uh, get the, the best and brightest, including those in, of, uh, of people of color. Thank you. So we got a wave of of new questions, so I'll we'll keep them coming. So the next one is, uh, I think Dr. Curser, you'd be a good person to answer this. They wanna know how um, our departmental faculty collaborate with other investigators at the university, um, as, as well as locally at other institutions and across the country. Yeah, so you're gonna hear a little bit uh, after this question answer about our, our research efforts. I think that's a, a, a collaboration is a critical part of that. and and we do a lot of team science, uh, but we do team care as well. Um, so uh, virtually every one of our faculty members uh, works with other people in other departments to help care for patients. Um, and, um, and because we are a referral center for patients, uh, oftentimes we'll see a patient once or twice and then send them back to the community. And together we work with physicians uh, outside of the university to make sure patients get the uh, highest quality care. Thank you. So uh, another question about the inpatient service, what sorts of pathologies we see, I can help answer this. You know, we'll see patients with TEN, SJS, patients with immunobolus diseases, chronic wounds, cutaneous infections. I mean, you name it. The, if, you're, if you're sick enough to be hospitalized for a der dermatologic condition, then you could be admitted to our service. So, um, Moving on to the next question, what exposure to telemedicine will, will trainees get? Well, right now, there's a great deal of exposure to telemedicine. Um, some of our trainees may say even too much at this stage, uh, but you know, we've transitioned back to, to a lot of inpatient, or sorry, in-person services. So you know, our, our trainees get a very good exposure to telemedicine. That is the truth. So I am not in the least bit concerned about their abilities to, to engage with patients over that platform. Uh, the next question is, um, let's see, how are residents evaluated to, to overcome deficits? Dr. Elgart, how do you, you wanna take that one? Sure, uh, you know, I think uh, as with any program, uh, we have a uh, system, uh, sy systematic uh, method of looking at our residents year by year and several times a year, uh, both through the chairman and through uh, various clinical co competency committees and so on. Uh, and I think the biggest way that, you know, the, the people who go into dermatology are so strong that the biggest way to keep them 
where they need to be is to let them know where they are. So we are very transparent about letting people know where they are, how, how they're progressing. Uh, if anyone has identified that they have a particular strength or weakness and to uh, build on the strengths and to uh, you know, knock out the weaknesses. Uh, there's enough clinical material and enough opportunity and enough faculty here that you can find an appropriate mentor or appropriate um, uh, resource for any kind of dermatology issue. So, uh, you know, we're lucky. We don't have a lot of people who fall horribly behind in anything, but I would say over the 30 years I've been here, there have been a couple times when people were, you know, challenged. Uh, maybe because of something going on personally or something uh, that was just difficult for them. And I'm happy to say that they've all kind of uh, worked their way back and uh, found success. Uh, we have a very, very high uh, match rate, I, excuse me, uh, uh, pass rate on the boards, which, you know, I think may, most programs have a good pass rate, but I think we have, uh, we've been commended in the past for our pass rate. So I think, uh, if you come here and you're paying attention and you're interested, you're gonna do great in dermatology. You'll learn the dermatology you need to know and plenty of stuff that's just fun to know. So uh, I think we have ample resources for all of that. Thank you, Dr. Cruiser, or Dr. Algert, sorry. <laughs> so the next question um, is, how do we encourage autonomy and transitioning to being a mature physician? I think that's something that our program does particularly well, um, specifically with both Jackson Memorial Hospital and the Veterans Hospital as major training sites. Uh, there's a natural progression um, to have more autonomy built into our system with, uh, with the second year residents presenting patients that uh, only presenting patients that require a new systemic agent or starting uh, a new medication or a new patient, but they follow, uh, they see follow patients on their own. Uh, and as third year residents, we have, uh, you know, trainees that are running the service that are helping uh, staff cases with junior uh, residents. So there's a great deal of autonomy, of course, in, in an environment that makes sure that the patients are taken care of and that it's safe for them. Um, but I think our, our trainees leave feeling very comfortable um, so I'm going to move ahead and to save some time. So uh, another question is, do residents have their own patient panel slash continuity clinics? Absolutely. Our continuity clinics are at Jackson Memorial Hospital. It's actually an ACGME requirement. So every Durham residency will have a continuity clinic. Um, the next question, uh, Dr. Kersner mentioned that approximately 10% of the training curriculum is dedicated to personalized resident interests. I'm interested in specializing in complex medical dermatology. Can you please elaborate on what opportunities exist within the training program to enhance resident particular interests? Dr. Kersner? Yeah, so, so uh, we encourage the residents as soon as they know what they want to do to tell us. And, um, and then once they tell us, we can provide opportunities uh, for them. Uh, some of them are just making sure that if they're in clinic and there's a great case that they get to see that great case. There may be opportunities for, to go to meetings or apply for grants or do research projects related to that. Uh, but then um, as, we, as they advance up uh, the training, there's more formalized ways we do that. We, we uh, make sure that we, we oversample them with things they're interested in. So if there's an opportunity, everybody gets uh, the basics, but if there's an opportunity to spend a little extra time in one attending's clinic because they have a similar interest, then that will occur. And then, of course, during uh, the third year, there's elective time uh, that that elective time can be used uh, to also focus uh, uh, on some of the uh, interests. So through a variety of mechanisms, uh, uh, we assure that uh, people get this personalized training. Um, as I said, 90% of the training is going to be similar and people are going to leave being great dermatologists. But we also want to help you find that niche, find your air, a special area of interest. Um, so that you can be prepared to take that forward uh, in the rest of your career. And I'll just add, you know, Dr. Kersner forgot his own initiative on uh, a mentorship. You know, from the time you get here, you will have mentors that you get to help choose. 
and uh, will be focused in areas of interest to you. So I think that's a big way that people expand their focus uh, toward things that uh, are of special interest. Thank you so much. So uh, next question, um, how many applicants do you invite for an interview? Uh, it varies, but usually around 40 to 50 people get invited. Um, the next question, uh, how do residents balance family life with such a busy service? Dr. Elgart, what do you think? Well, they're amazing. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's true for anybody uh, who's, who's a physician that uh, work-life balance is, is exceptionally important. And I think our residents uh, gave you some flavor of it uh, in the video presentation. But I think, it, you know, we have a big residency and we have a big department for dermatology. I mean, it wouldn't be big for medicine, but I mean, for, for dermatology, we have a big department. And uh, I see all the time where people say, hey, can I cover that for you? You'll help me down the line, do these sort of things. When people are under pressure, I think you're gonna get tremendous support from your colleagues. That's what I've seen for the nearly 30 years I've been here. And uh, I wouldn't expect that to change any. And I think that, uh, we have plenty of dermatology for you. You could, you could be doing dermatology 24-7 for the, for the 36 months of your dermatology residency. But most people find a balance with that and are very happy with the balance they have. And I'd like to add that, you know, uh, this, uh, there's an important issue of wellness that we, uh, we've taken very seriously in our department. Um, and we've had uh, uh, activities related to wellness for the whole department and also have uh, uh, helped the residents uh, do uh, wellness events on their own. For example, they've had two separate retreats uh, each year for the last number of years where they get together and do a combination of team building and non-dermatologic things. Uh, they take a day off from uh, work and, um, and uh, just focus on the, the wellness. So, so we uh, so the idea of work life balance is is very important and uh, we understand that you're in it for the long run and um, our goal is not to have people burn out in 3 years of training but be successful productive and happy for a 40 year career thank you all right, so the next question is about our dermatopathology fellowship i don't know that this is the best forum to discuss it but it's a fellowship program that would occur after your dermatology uh, residency training. So the next question about is about the PhD to residency track. We've had a few of these. Um, so after this session, we're going to have our research faculty give you a little presentation and they'll also have our question, question and answer session. Uh, they'll probably be the best people to discuss um, that specific track going forward. Um, there was a slide regarding pre-residency research and joining a research team. Oh, it moved on me. Um, how can this be pursued? Who is the point of contact for this? So what I was referring to in my presentation was that once you're accepted and you're into your internship, uh, uh, we'll reach out to you and we'll say, we'll talk about the research teams that we have and, um, and we'll ask you to consider uh, picking one of those teams so that uh, towards the end of your internship, you may get some articles from the team to read about, but when, you're, when you start, you're able to hit the ground running and go to some of the research meetings that those teams are having on a periodic basis, and uh, you can uh, get to know and understand the, the work that's going on during your first year. So, it's for, so what I was referring to is not uh, pre-selection uh, into training, but once you're selected, uh, uh, once you match with us, uh, during the year before you start your um, formal training, we'll probably reach out and connect you, uh, start the process of connecting you with the research team. Thank you. All right, so our next question is reflectus confocal microscopy or other forms of advanced non invasive cutaneous imaging modalities available to learn from? So, yes. They are, absolutely, and we have it at Sylvester Cancer Center, um, and Dr. Jaimes frequently uses it. Uh, is teledermatology an aspect of the training? Most certainly, more so now than ever in the past. Um, are clinical trials with novel therapeutic agents taking place? 
uh, and are there established relationships with industry sponsors? Yes, absolutely there are. So we have a clinical trials unit um, run by uh, Dr. Napkenner and Dr. Nichols, um, and they are doing a number of trials with novel therapeutic agents um, and have relationships with pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I don't know, gentlemen, if you want to add anything to, to that question. I think in the research section, you're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of the work they're doing, um, and uh, they're giving a, a, a brief presentation. So I think you'll, they'll answer that question there. Thank you. So uh, next question, what percentage of residents do a fellowship? Uh, what percent go to mm -hmm. private practice versus, versus academic positions after graduating? I mean, it, it's as much as a third go into fellowship, uh, but that varies. There was a period of time when it seemed like nobody wanted to go into fellowships, and uh, that's maybe 15 years ago. But I think what I will say is that our candidates or our, our, our residents who want to do a fellowship have had a very high success rate at getting into fellowships and to very competitive fellowships. So I think, uh, uh, you know, for those who are already looking ahead past their dermatology residency, they're, you know, if, if you come here, there'll be uh, great resources for you. Yeah, and I think that whether you wanna go in practice or uh, go into uh, fellowships or do academics, that, uh, our training here uh, will allow you to succeed any, uh, wherever you wanna go. And, um, and uh, I, I think, uh, and of course, as we mentioned, the sooner you alert to us to your interests of what you what your career is going to look like, we can make sure that uh, uh, we work together to make those career goals become reality. Thank you so much. So another question for you, Dr. Elgard: How about dermatopathology case volume? It seems like this person wants to do a Durham Path Fellowship. Uh, you know, I, I think that the case volume. It, in our institution is it's hard to measure it. it we have a, our own service where we see about 30,000 cases in a year. Uh, it, it can be a little more than that or a little, uh, little less, but it's usually around that number. Uh, and then of course, there's a full-time service at the Jackson Memorial Hospital. That's a lot of the cases are uh, provided by our own residents and faculty when they do biopsies or, or, uh, or, or perform procedures in those hospitals, they'll, they'll be involved in them. And of course, we cross cover those cases when, uh, when those folks are out on vacation or whatever. So uh, I'm sure there's another five, eight, 10,000 cases somewhere out there. Uh, but it's it's somewhere in those numbers. Uh, you know, there's plenty of cases. Uh, you know, the main thing is there are a lot of interesting cases and a lot of good cases. You know, you could get uh, 500 basal cells a day, and it's not that I don't want them. Please send. But uh, you know, I think that we have a good spectrum of cases, and I think you know, my in my training when I did derm path many years ago, it was the smallest number of cases I ever saw in my life. More, less than I ever saw as a resident, less than I see as, as a faculty member, but they were great cases and uh, I learned a lot. So it, it's more diversity of cases than actual numbers, but we got plenty. All right, so we'll do one last question because we're out of time. So uh, what is the best way to communicate uh, your interest to us? So you can reach out to us directly. Um, we're happy to hear from you and we, we'd like to know if you're interested in our program. Uh, it also doesn't hurt to have one of your mentors reach out on your behalf, honestly. That probably is a very helpful way to know, you know, let us know that you're, you're serious about our program. So thank you very much for your attention, and we're going to get started with the research component of the program. Hello and welcome, everyone. This segment of the program is going to be dedicated to the research activities at our department. Uh, my name is Mariana tomic Sanic, and I uh, do wear a lot of hats, uh, but uh, uh, for the purpose of tonight, I will serve as the vice chair of research, and my role is relatively simple. It's to help you succeed in any research activities during the res residence training that you would like to uh, take on. Uh, I am a wound healing researcher, um, uh, and a basic scientist, uh, a skin biologist. Um, I do, I study wound healing from soup to nuts. 
And um, one of the reasons of why I have chosen to join uh, University of Miami uh, Department of Dermatology is because it's uh, one of the largest and uh, most well-established wound research programs in the country and, and in the world. Um, tonight, uh, I will provide you with a brief overview of research activities, aspects of the research and how it, it um, integrates into residence education and training, a little bit about our programs and topics that will be followed by um, uh, short videos from our research faculty and their um, uh, overview of the projects and ongoing activities. Um, uh, and we will end the segment with um, a, a little bit about uh, research and the PhD program and some testimonials from our past graduates. Um, this will end with obviously um, a live Q&A where you will have opportunity to ask questions. So our research faculty has um, got together and we obviously formulated the mission, uh, which is to advance skin science through discovery and dissemination of new knowledge, uh, development and implementation of novel therapies and, and fostering future generations of scientists, physicians and physician scientists. And one of our research goals is, and, and the top priority is to mentoring future generations of scientists and physicians, which is where we welcome you all. And so um, Dr. Kersner already alluded to uh, how uh, we have uh, a, a grow, we had a, a significant growth in faculty over the last um, uh, four years. Um, among them, we also doubled the research faculty um, where we have a total of 16, uh, 13, which uh, do primarily um, research work and, and three that are doing a combination of um, a small percent of clinical work and um, a more um, research. Uh, we will also be adding three part-time research faculty and skin testing lab in near future. Um, as I mentioned, we have a very strong research base and we um, a, a function um, as a, a almost basic science department within the clinical department. Uh, we do have 16 faculty members, um, but in addition to that, we are all members of different uh, PIPS graduate programs, which is, um, um, it, you know, uh, the, the gra graduate research training of the institution. In addition to that, we do participate in different aspects of research. Every faculty does research. And as you see under the roof of our department, you have different sections and different activities. And we do um, uh, uh, like to participate in multiple ones, which is why you will see some of the photos repeated in different categories. Starting from molecular and cellular uh, analysis and studies um, to development of potential therapies, very strong dermatopathology, preclinical testing and models, to clinical trials and clinical research and epidemiology. But in essence, we do have a very strong structure of discovery pipeline that basically transitions into preclinical testing and leads to clinical trials, all under the roof of the same department. And so this triangle it really pr um, provides a tremendous potential for, for as a research platform where um, um, that structure allows for um, a, a integration of external studies, whether they're industry sponsored or come from multi-institutional collaboration. But this is um, a very productive and, and uh, extremely successful. So what do we do? Um, you can take from this slide, it's very busy and there are a lot of different projects and topics that, that our faculty are currently engaged in. We structured this uh, research topics under um, uh, five programs, a cutaneous cancer research program, UM, each center and skin neuroscience program, ADNEXA and metabolism skin research, wound healing and regenerative medicine research program and dermatologic diseases and clinical research. What's important that all of these programs basically rest on the strong foundation of preclinical models and testing, where we have really a plethora of different um, models that facilitate research in any aspect of skin diseases and skin research. 
we will now add to that uh, clinical diagnostics and test, uh, testing that is now uh, put on hold due to COVID, but it's already in place and, and we hope it will start in January of next year. We also have established a very strong pipeline of clinical trials unit as a structure that basically integrates into all of these research programs. The roof of the house is actually a, another set of really important activities that, that facilitate research in every of the program, including computational genomics and drug discovery, where we have to thank our research residents who actually facilitate and help this develop, um, including um, computational genomics as Rivka Stone and drug discovery aspect from NIAMISA. And of course, epidemiology and public health um, integrates well into every aspect of the research ongoing. So you could just by taking a look at this slide, uh, appreciate the diversity of research uh, that's currently going at, at the department. Our report card is that um, our research is supported uh, from government uh, sources and, and foundation and industry sources. Our fiscal year ends in June, and um, um, that's where we we'll, uh, take a hard look at numbers. And we had 103 funded research projects in the fiscal 2020, um, around $28 million, all of which 12, nearly 12 comes from the governmental sources, primarily NIH and DOD. Um, and you could appreciate here in the, in the science of, uh, uh, graphs uh, that there is, a, there is a, a steady growth in both funding and, and publications. And, and one of the metrics is uh, that we currently have 271 publication in 2020. And by the time, since this is pre-recorded, I'm sure this number will increase um, when you see, when you actually um, get to hear um, this presentation. And for the last year, we had a 316 published papers. Clearly, there is a high level of activity and productivity of research at the department. Are we making any impact? And so this is just a slide to illustrate that, that yes, our faculty is producing impactful publications. But in addition to that, we do tend to translate what we what we discover. And so there is a strong discovery portfolio at the department as well as illustrated by number of the patents you see here. And in the center um, is our trailblazer, uh, Dr. Badiavas, who actually started and built his startup company uh, based on the inventions that, that he um, his laboratory has made over the years. Um, and they are currently going into clinical trials. They received an IND and they're, they are now uh, going to be on fast track to, to uh, uh, clinical trials in testing um, a, a, a different form of stem cell treatments. And so uh, we do have, uh, as I mentioned, a very strong research base and that facilitates research education and training. Over the years, we have established the research residency track uh, for MD-PhDs, which we structured slightly different, where we begin um, a resident in the first year of research before they transition into clinical training, uh, which provides much uh, a better uh, longitudinal research aspects of activities that facilitate success at the end. Um, we also established skin biology graduate program, where we had an option um, of um, a qualified applicant um, for dermatology residency to, to actually take a PhD in our graduate, one of the graduate programs focusing research on their, on the skin biology. In addition to that, you heard uh, that we are first and only in the country um, that uh, basically developed master program in skin biology and dermatologic sciences. And that master program is it's in fourth, um, just enrolled and started the fourth class. Uh, we also established Dermatology Academic Training Program where we provide a, a structure and mentored environment for each resident to take part um, in the different research areas. Um, and as, as a research um, a training base, we do provide research training for medical students, graduate students, um, MSTP students, masters and fellows um, uh, across the board. And so um, um, just to, to kind of summarize this, that the dermatology, dermatology academic training program has two tracks. One is the research resident track, and the other one is traditional three-year uh, track that basically involves participation in research through 
research team meetings, projects, and production of scholarly work. And so you will hear later from Dr. Bedoni and Dr. Stone about the research resident track, and I will uh, give you a little more information about the traditional three-year track. This is basically the scholarly activities are built around um, different themes. Um, uh, cutaneous cancer, each hair, wound healing, stem cells, and pediatric dermatology. And you could um, uh, see from this slide that there is plenty of mentors that are participating in different themes and, and, um, and provide the various expertise uh, in research and training. And so we have it fairly well structured where the, uh, a resident in, um, is engaged uh, prior to arrival during their intern year. During the first year, there is more engagement and attendance to, to periodic regular research meetings and, and uh, team meetings with certain expectations outlined, such as uh, to, to either come up with a project or to develop a, a, a scholarly manuscript on the topic of the team. Um, and then during the years two and three is where the majority of work gets done, whether it's to undertake a research project or write um, a solid uh, three pu uh, publications and additional articles related to the topic. In addition to that, residents are expected um, to participate in different um, uh, skin club presentations and discussions, grant rounds, uh, if they decide to, to apply for funding sources. And of course, they do get to present in our annual release research day, which uh, Dr. Kersner already showed. But I think the whole point is that the third year residents actually mandatory have a presentation on our annual research day. And of course, um, um, any uh, first and second years are also welcome whenever they have um, a research activities to share. Some highlights of our graduates in the past three years, we have graduated three classes of master students. Um, um, three students actually defended a master thesis. We graduated four uh, PhD students and one can appreciate the diversity of, of different programs in which they graduated, um, all doing um, uh, research in skin, uh, human genetics and genomics, molecular cell pharmacology, uh, cancer and neuroscience. Um, uh, we graduated three research residents, all remained in academia, and you will hear from them um, shortly after my presentation. Uh, we graduated in the last three years 108 research fellows. And this is just um, um, a, a little flavor of, of um, what, um, uh, what are the highlights. Um, you know, our residents um, are well trained. Um, and uh, and uh, all trainees, uh, uh, many trainees have received um, uh, recognitions, um, starting from delivering keynote lectures to getting awards, winning competitions, um, and, and winning fellowships. So, um, as I said, this is a very dynamic research environment that provides really outstanding research training. And I don't know about you, but I still am um, uh, inspired by skin and, and the ability and diversity of, and of potential research and topics that it allows and, and affords us to do. Uh, I hope you get inspired by skin research um, as you become um, and, and embark on, on the residency training. And, and I think we especially have a very, very strong base that will support it. Um, and I, I know and I hope and, and I invite you to feel a little more like a, a kid in a candy store because in our candy store you can pick a lot of different topics to study um, that's skin related. And um, I wish you good luck in the process. Enjoy the process. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions later on when we have a live session. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Dr. Lee Nackenberg, and I'm an assistant professor with the department. And along with Dr. Anna Nichols, we direct the Dermatology Clinical Trials Unit. Our unit focuses on three types of clinical research. The first being departmental, which includes chart reviews, surveys, case series, and tissue and data repositories. We use this type of studies for our own publication purposes, but also to gather data for preliminary grant support. Our second type of studies we focus on are sponsored industry studies. This is our phase one through four drug studies and also our device studies that we use to treat different dermatology indications. And lastly, we actually do 
federally NIH funded studies as well. This is where we partner with some of our basic science labs in the department to collect clinical data that they need for their grants. The area of clinical research within our unit is quite broad, so much so that 21 of our faculty members act as principal investigators for all these different studies. And the areas within our unit can be anywhere from hair and nails, to wound studies, to skin cancer, to itch, and even pediatric studies. So we hope you want to become involved in doing clinical research. And you can do this by simply even recruiting patients from clinic, by learning how to collect surveys and take photography of our patients to perform skin biopsies and disease assessments. Or if you want to get a little bit more involved, you, we can teach you how to do specific types of wound dressings, sensory testings, you know, even EKGs and blood draws. So we hope you become interested in our clinical trials and good luck with your applications. Welcome to our program. My name is Ralph Paus. I'm a professor of dermatology in this department and director of the Dermatology Academic Training Program. This training program is found nowhere else and, and quite unique in that we try extra hard to keep our residents here not only informed but also excited and most importantly actively engaged in serious skin research, be it basic, translational or uh, Clinical. I've joined this department in uh, 2018, coming from the University of Manchester in England, for many reasons. One of them obviously being that the weather is decidedly better here than in the dreary north of England. Another was that I was deeply impressed by the family-like atmosphere of this great department. I've seen many colleagues here, not only working on a daily basis with each other, but having formed lasting friendships over time and joining forces between lab-based researchers and clinic-based physicians for the joint exploration of big questions. But the main reason for me to come here has to do with the fact that I'm what they call um, a hair guy. I'm one of the people who believe seriously that the biology and pathology of the hair follicle is one of the most fascinating things you can study in all of biomedicine. And I give you just uh, one example of uh, the kind of research uh, we are engaging in. Let me see that I get this working here. So we discovered recently that hair follicles engage in chemosensation by expressing smell receptors. And they can indeed smell substances like you have in your aftershave, which then stimulate one of the most powerful growth factors that prolong the growth phase uh, of uh, hair follicles, IGF-1. In subsequent work, we asked, but why can they really smell? What are they doing with these smell receptors all day long? And uh, what we discovered uh, is that, in fact, stimulating this one olfactory receptor called OR284 regulates the production of antimicrobial peptides antibiotic-like endogenous substances, which in turn regulates the entire hair follicle microbiome. And we now follow the working hypothesis that one of the things that these olfactory receptors actually do smell most importantly is bacterial metabolites that tell them when a certain type of bug uh, has um, overpopulated its niche, the follicle. Now, ev evidently, if they can smell, you've got to ask, can they also taste? And the most recent pilot data uh, that we have generated suggests that yes, indeed, they can. And your scalp hair follicles do express functional bitter taste receptors. And if you stimulate them with a sugar, um, you get hair growth inhibition. So, 
what we are doing here is we are using the hair follicle to uncover an entire new universe of skin biology, chemosensation biology, of the hair follicle guiding us to um, new frontiers in skin neurobiology and uh, skin neuroendocrinology. I'm sure that if you join us, you will be as excited about your daily life in this department as I've been ever since I came here. Enjoy the rest of this open house day. Hi, my name is Ivan Yozic and I am a research assistant professor here in the Dr. Philip Ross Department of Rheumatology at the University of Miami. I am a cellular biologist by training with specific interest in endomembrane trafficking and cellular migration. Initially, I was attracted to begin my career here at the rheumatology department uh, because I was inspired by the collaborative potential between the bench scientists and the clinician scientists that we have within this department. Uh, my research primarily revolves around understanding the role that specialized membrane microdomains, uh, also known as cavioli, uh, the role that these cavioli play in both normal physiology uh, of skin as well as the pathophysiology of various uh, skin diseases, including chronic wounds, uh, scar formation, and various types of inflammatory skin conditions. Uh, we've recently demonstrated that these cavioli play a pivotal role as organizing centers for various signaling cascades and uh, their impact is tremendous on cellular migration and uh, wound closure. Interestingly, we've also seen that cavioli 1, which is the primary structural component of the cavioli, is upregulated in older skin. So we're very interested in understanding the relationship between skin aging and cavioli proteins. Uh, furthermore, we've also seen that cavioli 1 is specifically localizes to the hair follicle bulge. And this bulge is an area uh, that houses hair follicle stem cells. So we're also very interested in understanding the role that cavioli 1 may play in either hair cycling or other form in various forms of uh, scarring or non-scarring alopecia. And lastly, because cavioli and cavioli are localized to uh, lipid-rich areas of the cell membrane, we're always trying to develop a novel lipidomic approaches to help us better understand the role that uh, various lipids have in skin physiology and, pa and pathophysiology. So I look forward to welcoming future uh, dermatology residents to work on these exciting projects in my lab. Everyone, uh, my name is Barbara Bedoni and welcome to my home. I am an associate professor of dermatology. Um, I'm a scientist with a research focus on melanoma skin cancer. The idea in my lab is essentially to um, um, decipher the mechanisms that lead to melanoma to then uh, design uh, novel therapeutics. So based on this idea, we've been uh, focusing on several projects over the years, but I want to talk to you about two in particular that we are interested in right now. Um, one of them stems from some uh, um, discoveries that we made a couple of years ago of, the, of a very important role of the tumor microenvironment when it comes to uh, BRAF inhibitor resistance. Um, we found that the tumor microenvironment has a profound influence uh, on melanoma cells and uh, uh, over time um, causes uh, melanoma resistance to BRAF inhibitor therapies. So we were lucky enough to uh, collaborating with a great uh, medicinal chemist that provided us with very selective inhibitors uh, that allow us to disrupt this interaction between the tumor microenvironment and the tumor. <coughs> By doing this, in combination therapy with BRAF inhibitor, um, BRAF inhibitor therapies, we can uh, restore sensitivity of this resistant tumor to the therapy itself. So this is very exciting, and we're hoping to be able to translate this uh, sometime in the future uh, to the clinic, uh, to the patient. Another project that is a little bit of a pet for me because we've been working on these uh, for many years, um, has to do with uh, notch signaling, which is an embryonic uh, um, stem cell pathway involved in many, uh, obviously in embryonic development, but in many uh, in, in tissue repair, um, but is also disrupted in many cancers, including melanoma. And one of them, in notch one, is highly expressed in uh, like 60% of melanoma. We have, uh, over the year, uh, years, been able to demonstrate that notch one is involved in tumor growth, is involved in resistance, uh, to apoptosis is also involved in metastasis. And recently, we found that NOTCH1 is involved also in immunocheckpoint inhibitor response. Specifically, whenever these tumors, melanoma tumors, have very high level of NOTCH, they tend to respond poorly to immunocheckpoints. So we found out 
you know, more or less the mechanism, but most importantly, we were able to, again, because the idea is always to develop a, a, a new therapeutics, we were able to produce a specific monoclonal antibody able to only target notch one, um, because we have several notch receptors, we only, only wanted to target one. Um, and by doing this in combination with immuno checkpoint, we are seeing very, very promising results. We see that tumors that normally would not respond or respond poorly now respond very well. So again, this is all done so far in animal models, but again, my hope and my desire is to move forward towards real translation, that is, to the clinic, to the patient. And the reason I, I joined the Department of Dermatology is exactly this, because um, coming from a basic science department, I felt that my, uh, my research had uh, to stop at a certain point, whereas here, I feel that uh, you know, I, can, I, I am in the right place to be able to really bring these findings to, to the clinic. The department supports um, the collaboration between clinicians and scientists. Uh, we have continued uh, <coughs> collaboration going back and forth between the clinicians, between the scientists. Uh, I've been able to collaborate with many of them um, over these three years, uh, and so I feel very lucky to be here, and uh, I am pretty sure that you will find that this is really a great environment uh, to do what you love, which is to care for patients and do science. Uh, with that, I leave you to the rest of the open house, and uh, good luck. Thank you for being interested in our uh, department. My name is Task Akiyama, I'm an associate professor who studies mechanisms of cutaneous sensations such as itch, pain, and touch using animal models. University of Miami has a strong neuroscience program. Through the collaboration with uh, neuroscience faculties, we use modern neuroscience techniques such as optogenetics, chemogenetics, single cell RNA seq, and tissue clearing to understand the complex processing of cutaneous sensations. Here I introduce two projects among the current project. We know from our daily experience, scratching the skin and relieves itch by activating the internal itch relief system. If we understand how scratching reduces itch, we may be able to find treatment that activates this internal system. Second project focuses on understanding the law of interaction between neurons and immune cells in cutaneous sensation. We use genetic tools to directly control the activities of immune cells to understand their laws in cutaneous sensation. Overall, my goal is to understand molecular and cellular mechanisms of cutaneous sensation in order to develop mechanism-based treatment for itch and pain. If you are interested in the project, please feel free to contact me. Hello and welcome to the Open House. My name is Irena Pastar and I'm associate professor here at the Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery. I'm molecular microbiologist by training, but I have been in the field of skin biology for the past 15 years. Today, I want to bring your attention to NIH-funded project focused on novel antimicrobial protein, Perforin-2. Perforin-2 is a pore-forming antimicrobial effector with a strong cytotoxic activity against intracellular pathogens. Once bacteria are inside the host cell, perforin-2 polymerizes to form the pores on bacterial cell wall and trigger bacterial killing. We have shown that gamma-delta T cells and primary keratinocytes are primary source of this antimicrobial factor in skin. And importantly, perforin-2 is induced during the process of normal wound healing. However, in cutaneous pathologies characterized with the chronic skin infections, perforin-2 is suppressed, resulting in intracellular accumulation of Staphylococcus aureus. In contrast to pathogens, commensal skin bacteria can actually induce perforin-2 activity. And we believe that understanding the mechanism of perforin-2 induction will lead to development of novel therapeutics targeting persistent cutaneous infections. We would be happy to welcome you to our Perforin2 research team. Hi, I'm Dr. Bonnie Abbas. I'm one of the faculty members here at the Department of Dermatology. I'm an MD, PhD, and a clinical dermatologist and dermatopathologist. My research laboratory is in the Stem Cell Institute here at the university. My 
scientific background has really been in, in stem cell biology. I've been fortunate to be able to translate a lot of the things we've learned from the bed to the bedside in a number of uh, clinical protocols that we are pursuing and have pursued over the years. I was a resident here uh, in the Department of Dermatology and it was my first choice and it was so because it provided me with a very solid clinical training. I don't think you'll find a much better clinical training anywhere in the country. Uh, th this gave me a very sound basis and foundation for a career in translational research because without that, it's very difficult to make that transition. Uh, there's also a tremendous opportunities here for finding people who are interested in moving these projects forward towards clinical studies. Uh, several of our projects are currently uh, involving the use of bone marrow stem cells and the products that they produce for the treatment of burns and several other disorders. I've also been quite fortunate in having several of our MD, PhD residency candidates or, or the people we have selected within my laboratory. Uh, they have all become very successful. Several of them, of them have made very key findings which have um, been published uh, and have won awards. Uh, this has provided uh, both them and our laboratory great opportunities for advancing our science and uh, thank you for your attention. Welcome everyone to our um, MD-PhD research residency program. I am Barbara Bedoni, an associate professor of Durham, and I'm a co-chair of this program in, together with Rika Stone, an assistant professor of dermatology and former trainee in the program. This is just an overview to kind of show you how the program is structured. We have um, a research that is done right away. So you enter the program and the f first year of residency is dedicated to research. All the first year is protected time to do your research. Then you enter the clinical training in year two, three, and four, and you're allowed here to continue your research activity related to the project uh, through funding fellowship applications, publications. In year four, you're given also six time, um, no, I'm sorry, six months of protected time to finish up your project that you uh, initiated year one. By the end of this program, uh, you will have completed a robust clinical training in dermatology and you will have completed your postdoctoral training. So here, I want to show you some of the, uh, you know, go over some of the questions that over the years, um, many of you, uh, or your or former you, um, have asked us a faculty about, specifically about this program. And I figure we can, uh, by putting it in a form of questions, so they may help you out, um, answer some of the questions you might have yourself. One of the questions that often come up is, uh, when does the research portion of the residency occur? I just show you, it, it starts right away, year one, and continues throughout your residency, but most, uh, most of it is finished uh, in the six months of the last year. Will I participate in clinical dermatology residency activity during my research year? Absolutely. We encourage our first year research residents uh, to participate in clinical activity, including management conference, grant rounds, noon conferences, Miami Durham Society meetings, and so forth, um, as the research schedule obviously permits. There is also ample opportunity to interact with dermatology residents formally and informally. Do I need a PhD to apply for a research residency track? Absolutely. You do need a PhD. It doesn't mean that you have to have it finished by the time you apply, but definitely by the time you start uh, with us. So PhD is a requirement. What does the clinical residency training portion consist of? How does it differ from standard clinical dermatology residency that you will find in other programs? You will complete three full years of clinical dermatology training. In your final year of training, however, you will still have, like I said before, six months of protected time to continue your research efforts. So uh, it's a little bit different than uh, other programs that you've seen in other um, uh, universities. Other questions, how do I indicate my interest in applying for this special track? After you enter your data in uh, uh, the ER, uh, ERAS, um, we will send an email to all applicants asking those interested to email us back, um, asking to be considered for this track. At that point, we will send you um, a follow-up email with more information, more details. What is the match process for this part? Applicant entered the general NRMP, 
match. However, one slot, one, is reserved for each year for the research resident and the rank list is generated accordingly. What is the process for choosing the research mentor? Our interview process include a part where we learn more about your research interests. Usually you are allowed to give a, a, a small talk and, and we work with you to identify a suitable mentor. Does my research mentor need to be a Durham faculty member? Uh, yes, your primary mentor uh, must be from UM Dermatology, but we do encourage you to find a collaboration outside Dermatology and essentially build up uh, your mentoring team by cap capitalizing on the University of Miami faculty expertise. How many residents do we have trained so far? We have four graduates, two current residents, and one incoming trainee this year. Is your research residency track officially accredited by the American Board of Dermatology? Not yet, but soon. Where are your graduates currently? Two of the graduates are faculty members with us in, at UM Dermatology. One graduate is in a leadership position in a pharmaceutical company, and one graduate, one recent graduate, is pursuing a dermatology fellowship. If I'm not chosen to interview or uh, to be ranked for this track, can I still be considered for a clinical dermatology residency position? Will I still be able to do research? Yes and yes. We will consider you for a residency position as we would other applicants. All UM Dermatology residents have a research requirement and we will work with you to maximize your time and opportunities based upon your interest. Who can I contact if I have questions? Please contact Ms. Jesenia Pomares, our residency coordinator. Uh, her email is jpomares at miami.edu. This is a snapshot of our graduates. Um, Arcelin uh, is now head of business in development at Regeneral Pharmaceutical. Anna Nichols and Rika Stone are both um, professors, assistant professor at uh, UM Dermatology. Uh, Jeff McBride uh, started a fellowship in Derm Path uh, at University of Oklahoma. Naim uh, has completed his research, uh, sorry, research year and is now in his clinical training. And uh, Hamed is um, starting this year, so he's a new uh, trainee in the program. This is just a page that I wanted to put up to show uh, their accomplishments. Um, all of them has, have uh, very, very successfully um, uh, have very successful publications over these uh, year and a half research that is distributed out throughout the residency program. Um, and um, and more, most of them are continuing their research. Um, and again, who can I contact if I have questions? Uh, please contact Ms. Jesenia Pomares, J. Pomares at Miami EDU. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Dr. Anna Nichols and I'm an assistant professor in the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at the University of Miami. I'm co-director of the clinical trial unit and the high-risk skin cancer clinic for solid organ transplant recipients. I was the second MD-PhD resident in the research resident track. I did my research at the end of my third year of residency and continued that during my first year as a faculty member as instructor. There's so many reasons that I chose to train at the University of Miami. I'll highlight two. First, I knew that the rigorous clinical training would help me become an outstanding dermatologist. Second, the rich research opportunities and supportive faculty would allow me to create my own path and navigate that. When I was in your position trying to find a department that would be a good fit for me, I was looking for a program that would be supportive and would give me the tools that I needed to be successful and then let me spread my wings and fly. I hope that all of you find a similar experience. I look forward to seeing some of you in beautiful Miami and I wish you all the best of luck in your futures. Hey everyone, my name is Jeff McBride. I'm one of the recent graduates from the University of Miami Department of Dermatology research track in which I was able to spend 12 months in the lab gathering preliminary data on stem cell biology and extracellular vesicle biology working with Dr. Evangelos Badiabis. I did my intern year at the University of San Diego, and after that, I joined in up in Miami and I started doing research right away. I really liked doing research in the first year and then transitioning into the clinical years um, for the traditional three-year track training. So that way I wasn't shortchanging myself at all in the dermatology clinical training, but I was able to get my groundwork laid for my research in stem cell biology. So after we got preliminary data, we were able to have enough to apply for a Dern Foundation grant, which allowed for me to have some funding to complete some of my studies as a third year dermatology resident. And 
you know, I don't regret the, the structure that we did where I was able to investigate during the first year and then use those next three years to blend in the momentum that I created during my postdoc, as you would call it, a mini postdoc after intern year. So that's one thing I would say is very unique about the research track. I would also say that the faculty was very supportive, let me investigate whatever I was curious about and essentially was able to forge my own path. I had support wherever I went. Uh, there was no shortage of people to ask questions whenever I came up against a research problem and there are a whole host of people to collaborate with now at the University of Miami and uh, the wound healing labs, the cutaneous oncology labs, the neurobiology labs, in addition to the stem cell um, efforts led by Dr. Badi Abbas. So I would say that if you choose the University of Miami, you'll have a great experience. Um, I doubt that you'll have any regrets at all um, doing your training there. And if your experience was anything like mine, it was able to build a foundation for a future in academic dermatology where I'm currently doing a Derm Path Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. And my plan is to join up as an assistant professor doing research, seeing patients, and reading slides. So I kind of modeled my ambitions after uh, some of the clinicians and, and Derm Path and researchers there at the University of Miami. If you do your training there, you'll be inspired. And if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My name is Jeffrey McBride. I'm currently at the Cleveland Clinic, and my email address is mcbrideejeffreyd -E at gmail.com. Thank you, and good luck on the interview trail. Hi, everyone. My name is Naeem Isa. I'm one of the research residents. I'm currently in my second dermatology year. Welcome to all, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the training that we have here, especially for the research inclined. We have the research residency program, which is a four-year program where the first year is spent as the postdoctoral research year, and it dovetails into your three years of clinical dermatology training. That way, it will allow you to not only start off with a focus of interest, but allow you to achieve grants and continue with the work that you started with in the beginning longitudinally throughout the rest of your academic career as a resident here. And the beauty of the University of Miami is that you have the intellectual freedom to pursue basically any topic that you want. So briefly, my research has been involved with uh, a drug discovery, and I do a lot of computational pharmacology, and I focus on Sturge Weber syndrome as well as chronic wound healing. And basically, I use computers to find new uses for old drugs using molecular modeling. And since I've been down here, I've been able to formulate a lot of collaborations through different departments at the medical school and within dermatology to allow for inter interdisciplinary drug discovery design. All right, if you guys have any questions, please let me know and enjoy your time. Hi, my name is Rifka Stone, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to tell you a bit about my experience in the MD-PhD research residency track here at UM Dermatology. I'm currently a full-time faculty member here in the department. I see patients several times a week in our South Beach Clinic and also conduct research in translational genomics, or skinomics. I use bioinformatics to analyze data sets from biopsies of patients with inflammatory and fibrotic skin disorders with the goal of figuring out the mechanisms that help identify biomarkers as well as new treatments for skin diseases with unmet needs. During the research portion of my residency, I was fortunate to have Dr. Mariana Tomekanik as my primary mentor, applying my genomics experience from grad school to the analysis of data sets from chronic wounds. Although I worked on multiple projects in the lab, my main focus was on analyzing data from biopsies of patients with venous leg ulcers that had undergone treatment with a bioengineered skin product in order to figure out its mechanism of action in vivo. The results of these analyses were published in Science Translational Medicine while I was in residency. I interviewed at multiple top tier dermatology departments, both for the research residency track as well as for a faculty position. And I ultimately chose UM Dermatology both times since I truly believe that this department under Dr. Kersner's leadership is truly committed to supporting my personal success as a physician scientist in academic dermatology and in helping me have a truly broad impact on improving patients' lives. Three things specifically stand out for me. The first is exposure. Of the 30 plus full-time faculty members, many of whom are world experts in their fields, along with the part-time and voluntary faculty make themselves accessible and available to run ideas by, 
which is especially important to me since I get excited about analyzing data from lots of different dermatology conditions and love finding common themes and connections that open new research pathways. The second factor for me is mentorship. As an early career physician scientist that really wants to com uh, commit to a successful translational career in both the clinics and the laboratory setting, I really benefit from the guidance and mentorship of faculty role models like Dr. Badialas and Dr. Yasefovich, who do this every day. They juggle seeing patients in the clinic while also running fully funded active research labs. And finally, I wanted to highlight the personal factors. UM Dermatology has truly become like a second family for me. I moved down here from New Jersey to Miami with my husband and two kids under two, leaving behind our extended family who love to come visit in the wintertime but are not here to help day to day. The path has been bumpy at times, but throughout it all, I've had the unwavering support of people in this department that are truly invested in my personal happiness. Today, four active children and one new home later, I'm truly grateful for their continued support and know with certainty that I chose the right path as a medical student facing the choices you do now. And I really look forward to having you join us as well. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Mariana tomic sanic and I am Professor of Dermatology. Um, and uh, I also um, have a function of uh, uh, being a vice chair of research at the department. And I'm welcoming our panelists um, of the research portion of the section, um, Dr. Stone. Hi, yeah, you guys just got to meet me in my little uh, pre-recorded video, but I uh, trained here in the research residency program and joined on the faculty a little over a year ago. Welcome. Dr. Bedoni. We can hear you. Hello, everyone. Um, you saw me too, a little blurry, but uh, I'm Barbara Bedoni, associate professor, joined the department about two years ago, and uh, actually very happy to be here. So whatever question you have, uh, I hope that we can answer that. Dr. Badialas? Unmute, please. I'm Van Badiavis. Hi. Welcome. Okay, so we can start with um, uh, some pre-submitted questions. Um, um, the first one is, why do you do research in the first year? So, Dr. Stone, you want to take that one? Sure. I think that uh, Jeff McBride in his video addressed this a little bit, um, but our program is unusual and unique in this regard. Um, by doing the year of research first, it really allows you to lay the groundwork for, the, um, for a really intense uh, postdoctoral research experience that you can then um, continue uh, to work on as a resident. And um, in fact, um, this really allows you to be very competitive to, uh, for a faculty position at the end of your residency training, um, because unlike some other programs where the uh, postdoctoral portion can sometimes be a little bit prolonged, our uh, residency uh, track really allows you to publish extensively as a resident and then really, again, like I said, be, be fully competitive on the other end. Great, so um, the other question that is here is, um, is every resident required to do the research? Um, and so I can shortly answer yes. Um, in different formats, depending on the personal preferences and, and the interests. Um, either, uh, as we explained, the, the traditional track will take um, um, the initial decision of the team, and depending on uh, what activities, the, uh, is there a clinical research or basic science research, uh, or if there is any uh, additional interest just in the, in the uh, subspecialty or, or specialization under that project. Um, uh, it can be done either, um, so the work can be done either bench research or clinical research. And uh, in addition to that, and as an alternative, um, a, a specialty publications that are related to particular topic within the theme. But every, every residence is required to participate in some form of research activities. Um, Dr. Badiavas, there is a question here that you may want to take. It says, um, are residents involved in industry-sponsored studies and at what level? Unmute, please. The computer challenged here, so. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the, uh, the, there are, there are um, the re residents have the opportunity for um, for industry-sponsored uh, studies. I mean, one of the things that I've tried in 
in my lab is to encourage people to think about alternative ways of funding. Uh, and, th you know, that, that involves the, um, uh, the development of things that have potential for commercialization uh, and for, you know, for entrepreneurship. Uh, because I think as uh, funding levels get tighter and um, uh, it, it, those, those are ways to keep your career viable. So, um, but, the, but the answer to that is yes, we're open to all, all options. Great. So, uh, Barbara, maybe this is one for you. How are students mentored um, in the research pathway? Do they have a group of research mentors based on the team they join in addition to their uh, PI? Okay. Um, myself? Um, so, it, it was uh, something that we kind of ran through the question and answer we wrote down. Um, we, you would have to have uh, at least a mentor from the Department of Dermatology. Uh, but uh, we definitely encourage everyone to build uh, a mentorship uh, unit, if you will. So depending on uh, the research, uh, you know, whatever, if you need some expertise, even outside the department, that would be absolutely fine. Um, and the mentor uh, will help you, um, you know, figure it out, obviously. But uh, the idea is that you will have one mentor from Derm, uh, and so join the research uh, team in the mentor lab and um, build up around that, depending on the research um, project that is gonna be your project. Yes, thank you. And so um, another question here is, uh, what supports do trainee have to obtain Derm Foundation Awards, um, American Skin Association Awards, or NIH? And so I can perhaps answer that question. I think this is overall, um, a very strong support in terms of um, uh, and, and very encouraged application for funding throughout the residency, particularly for the research, research resident um, track. And I would say that so far all of our research residents have obtained um, some form of funding during their um, residency. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, part of the mentorship of applications and putting them through um, is part of the training itself. Um, and then there is another question that relates to that that says, how are students supported um, to engage in residence education during the year between PGY1 and PGY2? So overall, um, the residents basically, um, uh, you know, start in the research year after they complete their internship. Um, so during the internship, um, we basically reach out and try to um, uh, find, uh, uh, connect with the mentor and um, uh, prepare in advance um, um, logistics of their arrival, but initially um, so that they are already matched with their primary mentor and the lab before arrival um, to UM. Um, Dr. Badiavas, do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, the... the, the... I've I've always encouraged them to part. There are there are a number of conferences and um, the, you know, there are lectures that the that the, that are available for the residents. And even while they're in the lab, I have encouraged um, the, the people who have been in my lab to attend those even during the first year, so they can get a little bit up to speed uh, before they actually start their clinical training. Uh, it's not that difficult. Often these things are are, are at lunchtime. Uh, and you know there there are there are grand rounds where cases are presented. Um, there, there is a clinical pathologic um, a conference that Dr. Elgrad has run for years. So there, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, I mean, you have to look at this as an integrated approach. I mean, the the um, many of the the you know the MD PhDs that come in have have laboratory training. They don't have his dermatology training. And so, you, you know, it's a, it's a prime focus for us to get them up to speed in that regard. Um, so we, we encourage them to participate uh, as much as possible in, in a lot of the training schedule throughout the, throughout the whole process. Yes, and so um, there is one more question here. Um, um, do we have to declare interest um, uh, for the track during application process, or this is something that can be decided uh, uh, prior to starting PGY2? So this is kind of a little ambivalent question, and I think for the research, if um, uh, you are interested in application for um, a research residency track, which is MD-PhD track, you need to declare that upfront. 
um, and email, um, uh, email us um, about the interest in applying for that track. And, and uh, part of the interview process will actually uh, be different in, in the sense that we'll, there will be additional research presentations by these applicants um, and interview with research faculty as well. Um, if this is about the research teams and selection of the teams um, uh, for the standard residency program, then that is something that you obviously can decide um, uh, prior to arrival. We would love to um, uh, engage you uh, during your intern year so that the arrival to the UM uh, and the residency program will be easier, um, especially during the first year. But in general, the interest in the research for the classic uh, three-year program uh, can be declared at the time of the arrival, if not during the intern year. So I think this is, um, um, I think, completing the questions. So far, we don't have um, more questions in, in a live chat. Um, I would like to thank you all for um, attending. Um, uh, good luck with your, with your application process and we look forward to hear more from you. Um, if you um, have any questions, you can email us uh, again. Uh, I will repeat, it's Yesenia Pomares, uh, jxp1880 at med.miami.edu. Um, or reach out, um, uh, our emails are all on our website and we look forward um, to welcoming you at our department. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.